evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Fish Natural Series clinic and seminar. Tonight's clinic is going to be Fishing 101, uh, basic fishing. Uh, we're going right back to the beginning where everybody should be starting at. Uh, for those of you who are joining us that's got a little bit more advanced skills, go ahead and stick around. You might pick up a few pointers about some basic skills that you'd long forgot or what have you. Uh, tonight, my name's James Davidson. This is Mark Dyer. We both work with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, the Aquatic Resources Education Program, and we're going to be the ones going over the class tonight. Begin with, we're going to talk a little bit about equipment. Some of the equipment you're going to see, potentially go out and purchase, and use, and to start off with, first piece of equipment most people learn how to use as far as a rod and reel, actual mechanical rod and reel goes, is a spin cast rod and reel. Spin cast. Important parts of this thing is going to be the, the handle of the grip, the trigger, the reel seat, the blank, line guides, and then, of course, the reel. Parts of that reel are going to be important. is going to be the crank handle, the release button, the drag adjustment. Mr. Mark, you want to give them a little demonstration on how to cast and how not to cast? Ooh, I, not, I can handle the not to. I'll go for it, buddy. <laughs> Hey guys, when we're gonna when we're gonna cast our basic spin cast rod, first thing we want to do is make sure we're clear behind. Okay, we want to take our rod, make a ten and two motion with the button depressed, hold it. When you come through to two o'clock, release the button. So we're gonna here. That gets us out there pretty good. All right, certain situations when it comes to trees and things of that nature, you may need to cast and uh, adjust your cast. Way. But right now, tonight, we're going to focus on the 10 and 2 cast. And that big focus is going to be with your hand on the handle, your finger on the trigger, your thumb on that release button. He's going to grip it good. He's going to mash that release button down. He's going to hold it. He's going to bring his arm back to where it's over his shoulder by his ear from the 10 o'clock position, 2 o'clock position where he releases the button. But at that point in time, the way the bait, the hook, the sinker, the bobber is going to project it out over the water. And that's the parts of the spin cast rod reel and the proper way to cast them all those. Next rod and reel we're going to move to is not the spin cast, but the spinning rod and reel. It's the next step up a little bit whenever it comes to skill level. The important parts to know on this one, once again, the handle or the grip. The reel seat is actually the gooseneck on the reel. You have the, the blank, then you have the line guides. You always know it's a spinning rod, rod because that bottom line guide is larger than any of the others on it. Important parts of the reel are going to be the crank handle. And the release button on this one is actually the bail. This little piece of wire right here. Proper casting on it is holding it by the handle. Finger or fingers, two fingers above that ghost neck where you got a good grip to it. Bring the line close to you. Put your index finger on that line. Flip over the bail. Once again, go from the 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock position. Release the line with your finger, and once it lands, you can either flip back the bow manually or just turn your crank handle. The drag adjustment for these is generally right here on top of the spool where that bow was. And like I said, this is a little bit more intermediate style of, of fishing rod when it comes to utilizing them. <clears throat> what I like about this little rod right here, actually, it's a lightweight rod. It's got a lot of action to it. And you can buy these in lightweight, medium weight, medium heavy, medium light, ultra light, and so forth, depending upon what you're looking for on action on the rod and reel. Save that. I'm gonna rig it. I'm gonna rig this later. So. Okay. Next step up. Getting a little bit more advanced. Bait cast rod and reel. Comes to parts. It's got basically the same parts on the rod that the spin cast had, as far as the handle, the grip. Trigger, reel seat, the blank, line guides. Reel sits on top of the reel seat, or it gets a little bit different. You have your crank handle here, 
This little star section is your drag adjustment. The release button is actually right here. Well, when you mash that release button, your thumb lands on that spool. You take your thumb off the spool, the bait starts to drop. Mr. Mark, do a little practice casting with that. This one is the more advanced, what you see a lot of the bass fishermen use, pro fishermen. Okay, guys, when we're using this, I like to go and depress my button and do all my line control with my thumb. These, is, it's a revolving spool reel. So if you don't maintain control with your thumb, but it'll overspin just a little bit. You'll get a bird's nest. I've heard it recalled as, uh, called a professional overcast. Backlash. We're, backlash. We're going to try and avoid that today. One of the big tricks that he's, he's doing that he's not talk, telling you about is whenever you go to cast that thing, your thumb comes off that spool slightly. Once that lure or that bobber hits the water, you put your thumb back on that spool to stop the spool from spinning. If you don't and the spool continues to spin, that's when your line builds up and you get your backlash or your bird's nest. Whoop. And one of the things about this, I'm not real familiar with this. This is not one of my rods, but uh, if you, you take your thumb, you can kind of control the distance on that bait by adding that pressure and slowing that lure down and letting it land a little softer. Correct. Your thumb, once it hit the presses the button, the release button, it lands on that spool. That's stopping that spool from letting out line right there at that moment. You go from your 10 to your two position. At your two o'clock position, you slightly lift your thumb off that spool and let it allow let out line. Yes, and one of the other things about these that we didn't really talk about, set the brake adjustment where if you kind of bounce that lure a little bit, it'll come out. If you if you've got it a little too light, you're a lot more likely to the backlash, backlash or overcast. But it, and that's another one of the things about those rods that I kind of like those rod and reel setups like that. You can adjust it to the weight of your lure for each individual lure. Right. That's also why a lot of these bass fishermen, when you see them loading up their boat to go fishing, you'll see them with nine or ten types of rod types of rods that's up on the side of the boat because all of them was already pre-adjusted to different size baits. Now then, if none of those suit your fancy, you can always go old school. A cane pole or a telescopic rod set up to do a little fishing as well. Myself, this is personally what I started fishing on was a cane pole. Later on, went to a telescopic and then advanced on as time went. Setting one of these up is as simple as tying your line on. I like to wrap my line up to give extra strength all the way up to the tip of my pole. Do a little half hitch, and when I run it back down, knowing the flexibility of these poles, I'll stop a foot short, two foot short of the bottom end of it, and that's where I start tying on my hook, my sinker, my bobber. We'll get into that here in a little bit. That way, as you're out casting this thing and pulling fish out, when you pull that fish up, the tip that rod up, that fish comes up and straight to you. You don't have to worry about holding your rod up high to get a hold of your fish. The cast motion on this is simply called a pendulum cast. All you're doing is picking the tip of the rod up, letting that line swing, and setting it down out there. <clears throat> now then, those are some of your basic rods and reels that you're going to see out there. What we're going to get into now is a little bit more how to set these things up. Because knowing the names of them and what they are and how to cast them properly does not mean you're catching fish. You've got to be able to set everything up. Mr. Mark's going to go over a couple of knot with you right quick. We're going to use one basic knot tonight. Uh, there are other on the Virtual Nature Center that you can look at, but tonight we're going to concentrate on one knot. Uh, we're going to do the Palomore knot. Why do you like the Palomore knot? I like it because it's easy just to tie. It is. It's real easy. <laughs> it's, it is it's, so easy that it gets overthought whenever some people try to learn it. Right. With a palomar, we're going to pull straight through the eyelet of the hook. we got a small hook so everybody can see it on camera today. Make sure we've got something that, uh, and then you, if, you're, if you're a rope guy, you'll pull this through here on what's called a bite. And you simply tie overhand knot and then drop your hook or your lure back through the loop. 
Now, if I'm using monofilament line or most of your fishing line, this rope, I, I really can't do this effectively. I want to wet this knot so it cinches down and it takes all the slack out of it. <laughs> but that's our pile more knot. Now, when he's referring to wetting that knot, you can simply take it and set it up against your tongue or use a little bit of saliva or a little bit of water there out of the bottom of the boat, whatever, to wet it down. And the reason being is you don't want to create extra friction on that line to create a weak spot in it. Weak spot means lost fish. Lost fish is no fun sometimes. I mean, you won't, you go home with a story, but not the fish. Try it one more. Okay. Try it one more time. All right, so we go through the, we go through the eyelet of the hook. Are we going to talk about the parts of a hook while we got the hook, big hook out? We'll get we'll get to that here just after this knot. All right. Then we go back through. You can double it to put it through if the eye's big enough. If not, if not, make a pass through, come back out. Then we're just going to tie a regular old overhand knot. Put our hook or lure through that knot. Then we're going to. Wet our line, feed it back through, and there we are. Another thing to talk about when, when it comes to knots. A good fishing knot is important to tie a hook on with for the simple fact it does not cause crimp in your line, it does not cause weak spots, uh, doesn't, it lessens the friction on it, and it has less chance to lose the fish. Uh, a lot of these knots, like just simple, I have sat there and watched people many times just start tying overhand knot after overhand knot after overhand knot, bunched off on top of each other. Each one of those overhand knots you tie with a single strand like that causes a crimp in that line, causes a weak spot and a potential loss in the fish. <laughs> now then, we're gonna get into setting it up, rod and reel a little bit more detail, but before he gets into setting that hook on there, let me tell you all a little bit about what the parts of the hook are. To start with, when he said he put that line through the eyelet of the hook, it's just like the eye of the needle. It's that circle up there at the top of your hook. Down below that circle, you have the shank of the hook, this long straight portion of it. Then guess what that bend right there is called? It's called the bend of the hook. Bend of the hook comes right up to the point, and on the back side of the point, you have the barb. Now between that point and the inside of that shank is called the gape. That gape is how that hook is determined a uh, size. This one right here is a 19 alt hook, one of the largest commercially made hooks there, there is, and it gets smaller from there. You notice I said it's a 19 alt. An 18 alt will be smaller, all the way down to a one alt. Then once you get to the number ones and get into larger numbers there, the hooks get even smaller than that. Let's test the zoom on the cameraman's camera tonight. Cameraman, shake your head when you got it. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a number four bait holder hook compared to the 19 alt. Yes. Yeah. Yes. A number four hook is a good all around hook that you can use to catch bass, catfish, crappie. I've even caught brim on them. Uh, but normally, if I'm going out brim fishing, I'm looking for a number eight hook. If I'm looking for larger catfish, I'm going for look with larger hooks. I mean, it's just that, that simple. You're looking at the size of your fish, their jaw structure, and how deep that jaw structure is. Now then, those are the parts of the hook. Now, when Mr. Mark here starts setting up his pole here in a second and, and taking you step by step through that, you'll know what he's referring to when he's referring to the size of the hooks and the different parts of them. Okay, guys, I'm going to sit down for this one. Uh, we're going to start from a rod straight from the package. We're going to remove our packing material. One thing that's handy to have when you're fishing, I always carry a knife. Uh, line cutters are good, but line uh, knives tend to be a little bit more versatile. So we're gonna remove everything that we don't wanna keep on the rod as we get started here. 
and they always have plenty of packing on everything. Y'all don't give me a hard time about putting this stuff on the ground. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna litter. All right. The first thing I wanna do when I'm setting up this rod is I'm gonna put the sections together, the sections of the blank. We're gonna check and make sure our line guides are lined up. Now, another thing, when you get these rods from the factory, they already have that re reel in the seat really good. So make sure that's good tight and cinch down. Okay, now most of your, I like to set my drag necks because it's, it's already got this handy tab on here. See right now, uh, your drag is what provides a resistance, allows your fish to take your line, take line out, yet uh, still, still keep them under control. Right now, this is set way too light. This has 10 pound test line on it. I really want to set it for about a five pound pull. So I'm going to pull that up until I feel like I have the right amount of tension on it. Okay, we're good to go there. Now I've been stretching that part of the line pretty hard. So I'm going to go on and cut it back a little bit. Setting that drag like that, ladies and gentlemen, is just from, comes from practice. There are other ways you can set it and be able to be set right there dead on the five pound test, or five yeah. pounds on it. You can hook it up to a small fishing scale or what have you. Uh, you cut it pull against it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, get to, you get to pull the face of the reel off. Pull against it, and when that scale shows to be five pounds, it is starting to pull a line out. That's right there is about right. But it's always best because you're always going to have a way to set those scales up whenever you're out in the boat and re-rigging your pole. Be able to sit there and pull on that line and be able to tell about where you're at. All right. Okay. Now we fixed my little error there. All right. We're going to take our line, go up through our line, guys. A lot of rods will have a tab down here. That's to put your hook in. We don't go through that one. Seen that a time or two. So we're going to start at our, our eyelets or our line guides. We're going to go all the way through. Guys, I got my glasses on tonight so I can see the line to actually tie it. All right. Now, one of the things, uh, like we have a tackle owner program that's out there, different sites around the state that have uh, rods that you can go check out if you're just getting started in fishing and you don't uh, necessarily want to purchase your equipment yet and these starter kits are handy as they can be and they're used there at most of our tackle owner sites you can but find those tackle owner site locations on our website agfc.com all right now we're going to go back with our hook we're going to do our palomore knot again it's going to be a little harder to see this time that's why we showed you with the big with the big 19 odd earlier. This is a number four bait holder hook. We're tying it the same way. We go through the line once, through the eyelet once, back through the eyelet. Then we're gonna tie our overhand knot. Put our hook back through. Now, a little easier for me to show this part. Always wet that line. It'll help your knot cinch down a little tighter. And also watch, watch your back. There's a backsided loop on this knot that can get hung on the backside of your hook and you don't want it in this little uh, eyelet in the joint here. So definitely make sure that slips all the way over to your knot because that will really cause a weak spot in your line. There we go. I got it cinched up. Now, the little extra line that's off, that's called your tag in. We're gonna trim that. It doesn't have to be super short, but it needs to be fairly short. You need to leave enough in case the knot goes to slip a little bit. Right. It has a chance to bite. Yeah, I like to keep it like a quarter inch or less. All right. Then we're going to put on a piece of split shot. We're, this is a bobber Show that split rig. shot up there, Mark. Show them what it looks like. All right. Split shot is a little round ball. And the jaw on it crimps around your line. Now, I've seen people, and I'm guilty of it, putting these on with my teeth, but it's a lot better on the, your dentist is going to tell you, 
Use your pliers. Use your pliers. That split shot, ladies and gentlemen, what it's there for is to help hold that bait down in the strike area, striking area that that right. fish is holding at. Okay. You don't want your, your bait to be able to float up too high to where he's not going to go to get it. Well, this being a bobber rig, I'm going to put this bobber. Since we don't know exactly where our strike zone is going to be for our fish, I like to start mine about 18 inches. And I like to keep my split shot three to four inches from my hook. <laughs> that bobber you put on there, ladies and gentlemen, it has two jobs. The first job is to float that bait up off the bottom to keep it once again within the striking area of that fish. That's its primary job. Its secondary job is an incidental job. It serves as a strike indicator. Now then, if Mark was to take bait that thing up and cast it out there, once it hits the water, he has to re-engage that reel. Right. Once he re-engages the reel, he's ready to, to fish then. What we're going to do then is we're going to keep our line semi-tight. We're going to watch that bobber. If that bobber starts to dance, what does that mean, Mark? Well, I hope it's getting some attention from a fish at that point. There you go. That means that fish has come up, and he's taking a look at it. She's taking a look at it. She's looking to see if it's something they want to eat. Right. Now, when the bobber disappears, what's our job then, Mark? Set the hook. Set the hook. Snatch a knot at them. Just real quick, full. It doesn't have to be anything over-exaggerated. Right. Just make sure the hook gets the, gets embedded in the jaw of the fish the way it needs to be so that uh, you, you, maintain, you maintain the fish and don't lose it. At that point in time, once we got that done, then you'll start reeling in the fish. Now, what kind of bait do you think we're going to use on that, Mark? On this, uh, I would probably start with either a uh, red worm, some type of, uh, or a minnow. Some red worm or bait. Natural live baits. When it comes to talking about baits, ladies and gentlemen, you have three classifications generally, basic classifications of baits. You'll have your natural and live baits. Natural and live baits are going to be like he was talking about the red worms, the, the minnows or small fish, night crawlers, night crawlers, uh, wax worms, and so forth. They're all considered natural and live baits. Then you get to the artificial baits. Artificial baits are what you're going to see that a lot of these bass fishermen utilize. And they are man made baits that are made and manufactured to mimic those natural and live baits. For instance, looking to catch a little bit larger bass, something that replicates a small shine, a large shiner. So incidentally, this one here is a little bit of a shallow diver. That length of that bill right there on the front of that bait helps determine how deep it goes in the water. This one here probably runs about two to four foot deep. Something that looks a little bit more like a frog or a small bass sitting there playing on the water. This one's a topwater bait. It's got the open mouth right there, no bill. It's called a popping uh, hula popper. You sit there and chug it across the water. If you're fishing a little bit cooler water, something that resembles a, a small trout, maybe. And on top of that, this one here has a, a propeller on the front of it, spinner blade, helps create vibrations. Along with those, you can also find soft plastic baits. Don't pull us out a crawfish here. I like to fish with a lot of crawfish baits. I, I love the smallmouth fish, so I, I got quite a section of uh, selection of crawfish soft plastics. As well as the worms. You can find them in all different shapes and sizes and lengths. Uh, you can get these worms like this right here on up to a 12 inch length and worm, all different colors. You'll find out that fishermen like to invent color names when they're doing this as well. Oh, do they? Yes, they do. <laughs> Uh, color is a very important thing when it comes to selecting some of these artificial baits. So when you're out there and you're looking to select some of these baits, I want you to think about some of the colors that actually draw fish. <coughs> the largemouth bass, 
Whenever he's coming out there, he's looking for his food. He's going to be listening more than he's looking. He's going to be waiting for something to invade his space. He's the grumpy old man of the water, how I like to refer to him. You drag a, a jig through his little bed, his nest, his home, and he's going to sit there and get aggravated with it and try to get it up and get it out. You take something that makes too much noise, and he's going to be mad because it's making too much noise. Now, when it comes to noise, each one of these artificial lures that I was picking up has actual beads inside to make them rattle as well. Each bait that you find that has a spinner blade on it is going to put off a different pitch or different tone with each size and different shape of those blades. Those are making noise to help irritate that bass. 99% of the time, I'm going to say, you catch a bass, you didn't catch him because he was hungry. You caught him because you made him aggravated. Now then, colors for those, you got some, some colors that actually draw the fish to strike. They, they produce the strike out of it. Colors like red, orange, green, Chartouse, chartouse, that's the most amazing color to me. Nothing in the natural world is the color of chartouse. But yet most of your fishermen you see will have that color repeatedly in their oh, tackle yeah. box. Yes. And it produces fish. The third classification of baits. Another fascinating way of fishing for me, grocery baits. Why do you think they're called grocery baits, uh, Mark? Hey, we buy them at the grocery store. That's why. I used to tell people all the time, my youngest son had his own tackle box. Inside his tackle box, he had a package of hot dogs, two slices of bread, some Cheetos, and a soda. And I asked him, son, why don't you want to use my tackle box? Why do you carry yours all the time? He goes, Dad, if we don't catch fish, I still got lunch. There you go. All right. Things like that, you can always use those. I mean, like he said, cheese, hot dogs, bread, all those are good grocery baits. And then you can find some other prepared baits out there as well that's made by Berkeley or some of these others. Well, and, you know, we've talked about a lot of things with bass, and, we've you know, we've talked about fishing with live bait, maybe for catfish. You know, one of the things we hadn't mentioned is maybe bluegill fishing with these, you know, with crickets on some of our live bait. Right, but when it comes to grocery baits, one of the things I I use a lot of grocery baits on is trout. Trout, you know, the marshmallow and corn. Corn, uh, all those things work. And since we're kind of talking about trout, I was wondering maybe if I could show them how to rig up for trout. Go for it. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna take our lightweight uh, spinning rod here, and someone has made sure and wrap this. number eight swivel and a number eight salmon egg hook so if if i can if i can get this little tiny bag open i'm gonna rig this I, okay well one of the things now we're gonna rig this in the middle with this swivel so i'm gonna have to have a little extra line set aside all right so the first thing we're going to do is put our bullet weight on here. That bullet weight's going to be put on with a cone shape, the, the narrow part of the cone, up towards the tip of the pole. Right. You want you want it you want it pointed towards the tip of the pole. That way you're pulling it back where it's pull, it's coming through at, at, like a bullet. All right. <laughs> then we're going back with our same Palomar knot. Okay. On this barrel swivel. Now there's different kinds of swivels out there. There's snap swivels. This is just a barrel swivel. It does not have the snap on the end. So we have to tie, we're gonna tie into it from both ends. 
So we're going to tie that, tie that up. All right, we're tied on one place and we've got to wait. All right, I'm going to show you this thing half rig. All right, so here we are right here. Now, remember, I cut that piece of line off earlier. I'm going to take this line. You know, one thing I didn't think about, I can't tie Palomar on this. No. I can't, you can't tie Palomar in the end. We were talking about trying to do just one knot tonight, but we're going to have to do another one. All right. We're going to tie an improved clinch knot, and I'll show you how to tie that on the hook here in a minute. All right. What I want to do is go through the eyelet. Make one, two, three. I'm tying it right-handed, too, which I am not. <laughs> Five. All right. Now we're going to take our end of our line, go through this uh, loop we've created down here, and back through our main loop. And again, we're going to wet the line, cinch the knot down. Okay. So we've got our two knots there. Now, you determine how much, I like about 12 inches of line on the back side of mine. It's going to vary with your current on how much, if you got a whole lot of current, you might want to keep it a little shorter because it's going to get, it's going to get it's to wind exactly. and get, and get uh, more likely to hang up. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep about 14 inches of line on here. I'm going to try and get this about 12, but when I tie it on, I'm going to have to have a little bit of a tag in to take off. All right. Well, now I'm going back to being a one, back to our original knot. I'm going back to a Palomar. So through the eyelet. And I know you guys can't see this up close. because my hands are too big holding this little tiny hook back through. Tire simple overhand knot. And bring our little salmon hook back through. Now this little salmon egg hook, it's great with a marshmallow or like some of the prepared bait we talked about, there's a prepared bait out there uh, that are some uh, synthetic salmon eggs called Power Bait, Yum. There's several different brands of those, but we want to- And, and this works for several different types of baits. Uh, corner marshmallows on this type of rig right here, the prepared baits that Mark just mentioned on this right here are actual salmon eggs themselves that you can purchase at a lot of bait shops all work on this rig. And another thing I like to do is when I do a rig like that, I like to tip it with a wax worm. Yes. But that's our that's our rig. I don't know if we can. Can you zoom all the way in on that and see how we're set up? But that's our basic our basic trout rig for catching or for fishing with uh, those different grocery baits and uh, <coughs> for pack baits. A rig like that doesn't only have to be for trout. I've used rigs like this right here with the Carolina rig and these smaller hooks. Also, with red worm or a cricket uh, fishing for bluegill early in the spring, whenever they're still out from the bank a little bit, not moved in on beds. I put your tip, Mark. While he's working on that, I'm gonna give Mr. Mark a hand, take a little bit of pressure off of him. That fisherman's knot. Right. That the way he was he tied in there. Fisherman's knot. We're gonna come back with our line right here. We're gonna run it through the, the eye of our hook. We're gonna pull us enough slack out we can work with, and we're gonna wrap the tag in around the main line five times. Once it's been wrapped around, right here next to the eyelet, that hole that was left, you run your tag in through it. And you've just created a second hole here that you're gonna pull that tag in back through. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't wanna twist the hook on this when you're doing this knot, making those twists. If you twist the hook, you're gonna cause that line to bind up and cause undue stress to it. You let your line in and you pull it down into a good tight knot. That fisherman's knot and the Palmore knot both if you want to practice them, you can also find instructions, a very short video on how to time at our virtual nature center. 
at agfcnaturecenter.com. And guys, if you do go through the tackle loaner program, you pick up one of our uh, one of our starter kits. Guess what? The knots are on the the knots are on the inside here. Okay, hold that up. Yeah. yeah. I would have just put it down in that cricket cage. I'm just trying to keep the trash from blowing away. But this has the the fisherman's knot in it, the improved clinch, and that will help you get started. Okay. All right. We've gone through. We've shown you how to rig the pole, the different types of rods and reels you can use. Talked about setting up with bait. Now, ladies and gentlemen, when you're setting up a pole with bait, you get it out there and cast out like I was talking earlier. You're watching your bobber, it's dancing a little bit. That means that fish is looking at it. Once that bobber disappears underneath the, the water, that means that fish is taking it. You set the hook, you start reeling it in. At that point in time, Mark, what's the important job? Keep the fish. Keep the fish. We gotta the, fight the fish. Gotta fight the fish. Keeping the tip of that pole up as you're reeling it in. Right. And not thing, giving him any slack. One thing I like to talk about when we do that is, hey, if you point your rod straight at the fish, your line's only bearing surface is right here. Right. Now, if this rod bends and flex and does what it's supposed to, the bearing surface on there turns into every one of these eyelets. So it's not one, so it's, it's maintaining the stress in multiple places versus right here if you point the rod at and the And that's fish. what that fish well, is fighting. For people to keep it up. And the action in your rod, the stiffness or lack thereof, depending on what you're fishing for, is also going to help you work that fish. Right. What they're looking to do whenever you're fighting that fish like that, and he's taking line from you, you're getting line back, he's pulling against the drag, he's pulling against the tension of that rod, the flexibility of the backbone, as a lot of us will call it, on that rod. As he's pulling against it, he's it's wearing him out. It's causing him to burn oxygen, the immediate energy that's inside his muscles. And eventually he'll tire out, and he may roll over on his side, or she may roll over on his side and come up, and where you can pull on into the water, uh, up to the bank or up to your boat. Once you get them up to the boat, you got to caught the fish. I can tell you right now, you don't want to reach down, grab it by the tail. <laughs> you grab it by that tail, that fish is flouncing still. It's got a little bit of extra added energy. The adrenaline's pumping because something different has got it. And those hooks that's inside the mouth can very easily end up in you. Right. Your first thoughts, they're like the pole bass fishermen do. Grab them up by the lip. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to pick it up by the lip, keep that fish supported straight up and down. Give, keep him uh, vertical there when you're picking him up to take that hook out. If anything else, what I suggest is wetting your hands. Keep your hands wet. Come across the back of that fish, laying these spines down here on these fins. Grip him right here. And once you control the head, you control the fish. Then you can take the hook out. Then you can feel free to grab him by the lip, pick him up by the belly, get your quick pitcher, give the kiss a little kiss on the fish, give him some sugar, turn him loose, or put him in your ice chest, however you want to do it. Or bass, or bluegill, or crappie, though, those first few spines you can lay down just by simply laying your hands down them, grab them up like this. Always make sure you go head to tail. Please don't go the other direction. It, 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 you will remember if you go the wrong direction. So yes, you will. Do that again. Yes, you will. Especially if you call the catfish. This is true. Catfish has more than one set of spines. It has a spine here in the dorsal fin, and it has spines here in the pectoral fin. Or, yeah, the pectoral fins as well. My suggestion on grabbing them is you can either grab them by the belly with your thumb and your finger up underneath that pectoral fin, that dorsal fin pointing away from you. Then you can pull the hook out of its mouth or Run your hand down until it hits that spine. If it'll lay down fine, if not, you can still reach around and grab it and control that dorsal fin and keep it from, from poking you. <clears throat> the bubbles, the whiskers on this catfish, they're not, they don't sting you. <laughs> that is a myth. Those bubbles, those whiskers, have taste buds all over them. That's their primary job. So allow him to find his food through those taste buds. Okay? Don't worry about them. But having said that, that's not the way you pick them up either. You don't grab them by the beard to pull them out of the water. All right. 
All right, we've handled it. We've handled it. What are we going to do once we catch these fish, Mark? And if we don't plan on throwing them back? I'm cooking them. Cooking them. We're going to throw them in an ice chest or put them on a stringer, right? Right. Buffalo ice chest or stringer, make sure you have it with you. A live well in your boat, possibly. But if you have a live well in your boat, also remember, whenever you're leaving the body of water, if you're in a boat, the live well, that you have to drain all the water you have in that boat. No transporting it past that point. What's another important thing we forgot? Well, we, hadn't, about. we hadn't talked about safety, but one of the things we talk about, it's not just our safety. When we talk about handling these fish, we live in a world of hand sanitizer, guys. Hey, that's great. If you want to use that, take the fish smell off your hands or whatever, but make sure you wash your hands with some of that lake water before you lay your hands back on the fish. It will take their slime coat away which is their protection from parasites and things of that nature. <coughs> All right, so we've, we've got that. I want to talk about safety. Okay, guys, anytime you're out fishing, some form of eye protection is good. I wear eyeglasses. I wear sunglasses, prescription sunglasses when I fish, uh, but wear something. Some type of uh, sunglasses. Sunlight is one of the big killers on the eyes as far as developing cataracts and causing uh, eyesight loss. Be able to, to protect them. Wear some sunglasses of some sort. Take a hat with you. Hat good. Keep, keep the sun off your head. Your from the sun. And sunblock. Sunblock. Do like these guys did me. Bought out some SPF 500 on me. We could walk through the sun that day. Uh, well, <laughs> and besides that, you know, hey guys, look, when, when we're fishing in, in the boat, we always think about we have to have our PFDs, we have to have our life jackets, we have to have a throwable available depending on what size boat we're in. Um, and certain, you know, kids, 12, 12 and under, right? 12 and under have to maintain it on at all, all times, times while they're in the boat. So those are those are three safety things. Always also start thinking about, you know, you're out there on the water, uh, you know, if you're, if you're using your knives, you're using your tools, make sure you put those things away, keep them out of the reach of the kids. Uh, because we want to, we want to expose the young people to all this, but we want it to be as safe as possible while we're there. Uh, what else safety wise? Hey, bank safety, guys. Some water's just not worth fishing. If you're wade fishing or if you're around, don't put yourself in a precarious position where catching a fish may end up may end, it may end up ruining your day by twisting an ankle, right? Falling and hurting yourself. There are some places that might look really good, but I fish a lot by myself, and I, I I don't I don't want anybody having to come find me. Uh, I like to I like to maintain a pretty good degree of safety even when I bank fish. And talking about coming finding you, that's another thing I do whenever I go out fishing or hunting by myself. I leave a trip plan. I let somebody know where I'm going to be and about what time I'm going to be home. And if I'm not home by by so long after that, they'll send somebody out to look in. Ladies and gentlemen, just be smart about it. Your life's not worth a couple of fish. Right. Now, there is something else we haven't mentioned also that you got to have, especially if you're 16 years of age or older. That's right. You yeah. support this program. Got to have a fishing license. That's right. And you can purchase one of those at agfc.com as well. <laughs> uh, I'm getting cues behind the camera. This weekend. Free fishing weekend. Don't need a license this weekend from noon Friday until is it midnight Sunday night. You don't need a license. Uh, don't need a trout stamp. You can come out and fish, fish for free. But all other rules and regulations have to be followed. Our possession limits and such like that. So, questions from beyond. Catch that big fish and get it out of there. Look for log jams. Um, Sometimes floating the body will hook onto that hook as it comes through and it'll wind up straightening it up as it's going through. Uh, large turtles and reptiles and lockets at times will also be the problem. You say two aught? Two or three aught. Two aught, three aught. 
I'd probably go up. Uh, you could try going up in hook size. I'd probably stay six six odd or below, unless you're catching some really big, big fish. Flat if you're going really big fish, really big blues, really big flatheads, if you're in bigger water, you even go up to an eight odd. Eight odd or ten odd. Uh, yep. You know, I, I I try and most of my limb lines, trot lines, and everything are set between a four odd hook and an eight odd hook, depending on what water body I'm going on. Hot dogs for bluegill. I have seen hot dogs being used in small chunks of ham. Uh, hot dogs usually, though, when I'm thinking hot dogs is bait, I'm thinking more channel catfish. Yeah. Old Keith Stevens or Keith Sutton trick, soaking them inside some strawberry unsweetened Kool Aid and a couple of tablespoons of minced garlic. Uh, when you are moving your chain pole, where do you put your hook so it doesn't slide everywhere? You can take and wrap it around that pole and then tie it off with a small piece of the cloth or a yarn, and that way it secures it to it, or you can simply cut off that hook. That, that's a place where snap swivels really come in handy, so you can just take the, take the hook off. Right. Do you use the small or big marshmallows when you're using the uh, Small. Small as possible. Even on the miniature. The minis are really good. There's, there's the small marshmallows, and then they've got some new minis out now. If you're, trout, if, if you're trout fishing, the minis are about the same size as the commercially made uh, fake salmon eggs. I like the minis if you can find them, but most of the time you're just going to get the small one. Even when doing that and fishing with marshmallow and wax worm and such like that, I'll take even those mini marshmallows and paint them into smaller sections. That marshmallow is not actually the bait they're hitting. It's actually ser uh, serving as a floatant to get it up off the bottom and into that current. Any other questions? Come on, ladies and gentlemen, ask away. Is there a fish that we should not eat? Fish you should not eat. There are portions of some fish you should not eat. Uh, as you get into it, you may want to adventure out and try different species of fish and what have you. Um, every region has their favorites. I mean, here in Arkansas, I know my personal favorites are going to be number one, bluegill, red ear sunfish, crappie. Mm -hmm. And then the flag egg catfish, but you'll find them throughout the throughout Arkansas as well. That still like to eat gar and stuff like that. You can eat all these fish except for the gar. You cannot eat the roe inside those fish. Those the roe is toxic inside the gar. Well, and also check your regulations books. Some of the different water bodies that we go to have limits to the amount of fish you can eat out of there. Right. Uh, due to Special different water, different water conditions. There'll be an area inside those red book red books that'll show ones that have possible mercury contamination or other contaminants. How do you catch a crappie? <laughs> How do I catch a crappie? There's several ways to do it. I mean, I've gone out and used a bobber rig and simply uh, a number four hook with a shiner on it, set up about 18 inches to two foot, get them up while they're bedding in early spring or in the uh, late fall, early fall as well, when that water temperature hits just right, right in there. Uh, one of my favorite ways, though, is to double bait it. I like to use a jig and then tip a minnow through the lip and let that minnow work that jig around, fishing about two foot deep. Uh, can a reel handle any pound test of line? No, no. You look on that reel, it'll give you a suggestion of what size lines it'll hold a lot of times. And the manufacturers not only do that, but they suggest about how many yards of that line they can hold on there. Right. And whenever you're matching up your rods and reels, you, or you, your reels and your line, you want to match up the rods as well. The only thing that you're actually really worried about not matching the rod toes when it comes to fly fishing. And that's an important thing to talk about as well. Hey guys, if you're spooling one of these things up, don't you can't fill the entire spool or you end up having some trouble. Make sure you leave just a little, sp a little space in there. Uh, normally they have a beveled edge. You wanna stay uh, a little bit below the beveled edge on the spool and don't over spool your reel. What is a one-aught hook? What is a one-aught hook? A one-aught hook is just a little bit larger than a number one hook. It'll show on the size on that packaging, one slash zero. Don't scream, don't run around, it doesn't help. The first thing I would do is look for somebody to help me remove the hook. And there's 
few uh, removal techniques you can find on the internet to do that, but my suggestion is simply find you an EMT, find you a doctor if you can't get it out yourself. How do you catch an alligator gar? You use big bait. <laughs> Let's see. Last time we went gar fishing, we used cut bait. Buffalo. Uh, they, like, they like cut buffalo. They like fresh shad. Some people will freeze their shad. They like they tend to like the fresh ones better. Uh, a lot of people will catch uh, gar on jug lines, which is not something we covered today. Um, that gets a little bit more advanced. That gets that gets into kind of a fishing two hundred one course. Yeah, um, but it that's just really not a target species that I would say just right out of the gate. I would I would encourage people no, to go after. That wouldn't be one of my first targets. I had a young lady want to know if we could show her what a one aught hook looks like. We do not have one. Uh, we have a three aught hook that we can show, and we can compare that to the number four that we showed earlier. Yeah, three out worm hooks. Now, one of the things that you need to know when it comes to these hooks, sometimes they have uh, different shanks for different purposes. Step on up there a little bit. I'm going to say good. I'm going to do a little human zoom here. How's that? This is a three aught hook as compared to a number four hook. This is what we use in a lot of our plastic, plastic, soft plastic fishing. I'll use a three aught to a five or a six aught hook depending on the size of soft plastic that I'm using. And this is our number four bait holder. Now this one has what's called an offset shank. And all that means is it's got this little crook in the shank of the hook. Did that, hit, that help? Best place to fish in Central Arkansas and the Hot Springs area. Central Arkansas Hot Springs area. If I was fishing Hot Springs, I'd fish just about any any place below one of those dams. They're on, on Lake Washita, Catherine, Hamilton. And Hot Springs Hatchery this Saturday morning. Now here, this area, Lone Oak, Joe Hogan Fish Hatchery, Saturday morning from eight to nine. A year. <laughs> it's, it's, you have to pre, you have to register for the fishing derby this year. The fishing derbies are this Saturday at all of the warm water hatcheries in the state. There's one in Corning, there's one in Centerton, there's one here in Lone Oak, and there's one in Hot Spring. Okay, uh, they're going to put the link in the chat for you on that. Are there bigger than a 19 on? Not much. Not much. I think there may be two others a bit, little bit bigger. But that one there is the, the one that's the most commonly made for shark fishing, actually, is the 19 all. I think we're safe in Arkansas not having anything larger than a 19 all. I, mean, I used to tease people and tell them that was my brim hook. That's a big brim. <laughs> all right. Any, anything else? Can I close? Go ahead and close. Okay, guys, we really appreciate you coming tonight. And I I hope that the answers we gave you to most of your questions uh, were helpful. Uh, we really, really want to encourage everybody to get out there. You know, this is a, this is a fishing one-on-one -on -one class. We're trying to get uh, people interested and get you out there on the water. Just get out there, enjoy yourself, be safe. And uh, we'll see you next month. We've got a, We've got another program coming up. Uh, second Tuesday of next second month. Second Tuesday of next month, we're doing a pond management seminar. So any of you guys that have maybe farm ponds that you fish that that uh, are there, we're going to have some people in uh, from the fish industry, some biologists, and they're going to talk about how to manage your pond. Like you own a home and have a pond in the backyard. I think it's going to be a, it's it's going to be another panel. And I think it's gonna I think it's gonna be a good thing for us. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
as far as your, your derbies this weekend, ladies and gentlemen, be sure to come out and enjoy it. Uh, anybody's allowed to come out and fish as long as you register first with the kid. Come out with your, with your kids or your grandkids and do a little fishing with them. Uh, catfishing at most of the warm water derbies around the state. And all, all of our free fishing derbies as far as the hatcheries go. <laughs> Remember, follow the, the rules and regulations while you're there. I think it's a limit of three catfish per person is all we're allowed to bring out. Uh, you can find that link on our website, agfc.com as well. They're on the homepage. I believe it's still running through the banner. Yeah, and you can also check on our website because although we do have the free fishing derbies at the hatcheries, there are lots of derbies around the state. You may find one in your own hometown. So, um, Thanks again, everybody, for coming out. We'll see you next month. Thank you. Um.